I read this uh, article the other day that talked about things I really don't understand. And it had this list of questions for which there doesn't seem to be a clear-cut, immediate answer. And I'm going to give you a few of them. One of the questions it says, it, it asked is, why do doctors and dentists call what they do practice? Why is abbreviation such a long word? Why is it that when you're driving and looking for an address, you turn down the volume on your radio? Why is a boxing ring square? What was the best thing before sliced bread? And how did a fool and his money get together in the first place? Now, some of these questions are a little bit silly, but they highlight this idea that, you know, taken on face value, there are certain things that are a little bit confusing, that don't have any quick, definable, clear-cut answer. And the same thing is true with today's parable that Jesus told to his disciples. As is sometimes the case, Jesus tells us a story that on face value makes us do a double take. And we have to go, what? What does that mean? And it kind of leaves us to connect the dots ourselves. The one thing that he is clear on is the topic of this story. Our text today begins with the words, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And so we know what we are supposed to take from this teaching even before we begin. It is a teaching about prayer generally and about the need to persevere in prayer more specifically. I mean, we know that much. Jesus tells us this plain and simple. But the story that he then uses to teach us about this may leave some of us scratching our heads. In this parable, we have two characters an unjust, atheistic judge, and a persistent widow. We're told that the judge doesn't fear God or really care what other people think. Uh, we're not actually told whether or not he cares about justice. I'm generally of the opinion that he didn't, since most scholars paint a picture of first century judges as being greedy and corrupt. And so uh, I doubt that he adhered to a strict and just rendering of the law. And I think Jesus' listeners would have been familiar with those kinds of judges. The other primary character in this story is a widow. Now, there would have been few categories of people as vulnerable as widows in the first century Jewish world. In ancient Israel, women only had rights inside their own home. And even that was very limited. The man had authority over his wife, and his daughters, and he generally controlled all of their activities and all of their relationships. Women were passed from the control of their father to the control of their husband and had very little say in the matter. So women who lost their husbands were quite literally at the mercy of others. All of their security, all of their sense of belonging was bound up in the protection of their husbands. Without this, they had no status, no rights, and very little power. So Jesus deliberately builds into this story this stark set of contrasts. On the one hand, we have this individual of status and power and influence. And then on the other hand, we have this individual with no status and no power and no standing who's virtually helpless. Now, we don't know anything about the nature of this widow's grievance nor do we know who her actual opponent was. We simply know that she had a grievance and that she was extremely desperate and stubborn. She continually comes to the presence of this judge and her persistence over time wears him down to the point where he eventually says, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, 
Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Now one would think that this judge who has all of this power should be able to keep this woman from being a constant headache to him. I mean, why is she allowed to do this kind of thing? Well, Kenneth Bailey, who is this highly regarded professor of Middle Eastern studies, shed some light on this with his personal testimony that I read about his teaching days in Beirut, Lebanon, during the height of the Lebanese Civil War that lasted from 1975 until 1991. He said that during that time, there was a violent militia that had its headquarters not far from where he lived. Bailey understood that he was not to notice or pay any attention to the heavily armed men who were guarding the entrance. But he said that there was this one old woman dressed in a traditional long black dress with a black head covering who would regularly walk past that building, stand out front, and point her finger at the guards, yelling at them to get out. And he said the guards would smile, address her politely, and tell her not to get upset. Now, had any man engaged in such activity, he would have been shot immediately. But because this woman was deemed to be powerless, she was tolerated. The widow in Jesus' story had absolutely no power, but that might have actually been her one resource. And so she's continually persistent in her cries for justice to this unjust judge to the point where he just can't take it anymore, and so he grants her justice. There's no hint of human compassion or empathy from the judge, not the slightest inclination that the judge is moved by any sense of right or wrong in this case. This woman is an inconvenience to him, plain and simple, and he just wants to get rid of her. Jesus says, in essence, pray like this widow. What? Because I don't know about you, when I read that, I don't find it easy to pray like this widow. I mean, my prayer life is nowhere near marked by that kind of persistence and intensity. And why is it? I mean, why is that that we struggle in that way with our prayer life? Maybe we're too busy? Prayer takes time, after all, and we never seem to have enough of that around. Maybe we struggle with an inner sense that prayer doesn't seem to be working all that well. I mean, we've all prayed for many things, haven't we? We've prayed for our own health, or the health of our loved ones. We've prayed for peace in our lives and in this world. We've prayed for people who are struggling, hurting, and suffering. And yet bad things just keep happening. Or maybe we struggle with doubt. Perhaps we wonder if God is listening or if God is even there. How many of us, if we were honest, have wondered at times if our words of our prayers just aren't being sucked up into some big black hole of nothingness? And this isn't new to the people of faith. This particular teaching of the per persistent widow by Jesus is specific to Luke's gospel. And if we take a look at the context of the readers of Luke's gospel, it, it sheds some light on this teaching and helps us to see maybe why Luke specifically decided to include this teaching in his gospel. Most scholars believe that Luke was writing about a generation or so after Jesus died. So uh, it would have been at the latest, or earliest actually, around 60 AD. It's also believed that Luke is the author of the book of Acts, which is also deemed to have been written uh, in the latter half of the first century due to the events that are described in that book. So if we take this to be the context for Luke's gospel, 
then we know that Luke's audience was composed primarily of second generation Christians. Most of them had never personally witnessed Jesus firsthand, and yet they had become a part of this burgeoning Christian community and had committed themselves to the gospel message. Subsequent to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, uh, the political and the cultural pressures continued to mount against Christians in that time and in that place in the world. And they were beginning to face severe opposition and persecution. At the time that this written gospel of Luke was being circulated, following Jesus was definitely not fun for these people. Not at all. Now initially, there was this sense in the early Christian movement that Jesus was going to return imminently. And that if they could just hold on, that he'd be there soon and make everything right. But that was early on in the movement. By now, people were coming to grips with this sense that, well, maybe Jesus isn't going to come back as soon as everyone hoped. And they were tired, and they were discouraged, and they were losing heart. They didn't know what the future had in store for them, and some, I would say maybe even many, were beginning to, or were reaching the verge of giving up. And this parable... This teaching of Jesus serves to encourage these people not to give up, never to lose heart, to keep showing up, no matter how vulnerable they felt or how hopeless the situation seemed, to hang on to God through this persistent prayer. And in this sense, I think this parable is somewhat similar to the story of Jacob that we went over a little while ago in the book of Genesis, where Jacob was wrestling with this strange man throughout one particular night. And in the process, he discovers that he was in some mysterious way actually wrestling with God. Well, after wrestling throughout the night, God changes his name from Jacob to Israel, which literally means to struggle or to wrestle, indicating that Israel or God's people would be a people that struggles and wrestles with God. The common thread that unites Jacob and this widow in Jesus' story is this idea of persistence and struggle over time. And that's something that I think we need to hear in our day because I believe our culture is uniquely impatient. We expect everything to come to us quickly. We're used to getting what we want and when we want it. We're used to information, information appearing before our eyes instantaneously at the click of a mouse, to being able to send messages instantly all around the world. We do not like to wait for anything. And I think we bring this ingrained experience into our understanding of how our life of faith and prayer ought to work. And when we don't see immediate results, people tend to give up. Or we water down our prayers and we fill them up with nice sounding words, but deep down inside we really don't expect much from God. And that to me is a different kind of giving up. The call to us is the same as it has always been down through the ages. Keep praying. Keep persevering. Keep struggling. It's not easy. Persevering is hard work. I mean, sometimes we might wish that God would find an easier way to train us up in this life of faith. You know, that maybe it wouldn't be so demanding and that he wouldn't require so much of us. Sometimes, I think we really would prefer an instant faith. You know, whereby believing and saying and doing the right things instantly produces in us the right virtues and magically fixes all the problems in our lives and in the world. But this isn't how God works. And the truth is, this has never been the way that God works. If you look throughout the pages of Scripture, nothing in the life of faith happens quickly. God's ways are always slow. 
Remember Moses spending 40 years of his life in the desert? And I think that they're slow because it has something to do with the fact that it involves us in the process. But even so, as, as, I, as I look at the stories in the Bible, sometimes I can't help but wonder why God places such a premium on persistence. I mean, if I find it kind of tedious to repeat the same requests over and over and over and over again, surely God must get tired of hearing them. I mean, why must I continually pound my fists on the doors of heaven with the same cries and the same requests? Why won't a single sincere request suffice? Well, there's one author, uh, Jerry Sitzer, who sees perseverance through the eyes of a parent. And here he says, My kids have asked me for many things over the years. A CD player, bicycle, boat, car, house, exotic vacations, you name it, they have asked it. I ignore them most of the time. I am as hard-hearted as they come, a parent made of granite. My ears perk up, however, when they persist, because persistence usually means they are serious about something. Well, if you look through the encounters that Jesus had throughout his life, there are a number of individuals whose persistence demonstrates their seriousness about their condition, about their life, about their pursuit of Jesus. From the woman who was bleeding from a hemorrhage for years, who fought through the crowds in order to just touch the fringe of Jesus' cloak, to the blind man who cried out to Jesus as he passed by, Son of David, have mercy on me. And who kept crying out even though the disciples got angry at him and told him to shut up. To the Canaanite woman who pestered Jesus about her afflicted daughter and the disciples implored Jesus, Send her away, Jesus. She keeps crying out to us. To the four men who carried their friend on his stretcher, cut a hole through the roof of a house in order to lower him down into the presence of Jesus. All of these individuals demonstrated this, this kind of dogged persistence. Philip Yancey, in his book on prayer, makes this comment. Always respectful of human freedom, God does not twist arms. God views my persistence as a sign of genuine desire for change, the one prerequisite for spiritual growth. When I really want something, I strive and persist, whether it's climbing Colorado's mountains, chasing the woodpeckers away from my roof, or getting a high-speed internet connection for my home. I'll do whatever it takes. Do we show that same kind of persistence in prayer? And what would our lives be like? One of the movies that almost made it to our summer Karis at the Movies series was the movie Lincoln that was directed by Steven Spielberg. Uh, researching this movie and watching this movie was an eye-opening experience for me because Spielberg's Lincoln is this intense, driven, passionate man consumed with ending slavery. I mean, he was all in, all the time. He went to bed with it on his mind. It was the first thing that he thought about when he woke up in the morning. He was burdened by it. He was always wrestling with it, with this intensity and this passion that struck me as something new to my understanding of Lincoln. I never really saw that side of Lincoln. Like many of you, I've read most of his speeches in, in, in school, and while they're amazing speeches, I mean, this man was incredibly intelligent. But they're all written in that 19th century English prose, right? So although they're very articulate, they, they, they're somewhat flowery and intellectual sounding, and so one tends to lose the sense of passion and humanity that lies underneath it. Like many of you, I've, I've gone to the Lincoln Memorial, you know, with this immense 
statue of Abraham Lincoln sitting in that chair looking down at you. It's quite impressive. But again, to me, there's more a sense of stoicism and respect that you feel as you look up at this massive monument. Like many of you, I've seen pictures of him in our school books. But you know, back in those days, nobody ever smiled, right? And so again, I had this impression of Lincoln as being this kind of stoic, reflective, monotone-sounding kind of individual. And of course, Disneyland's portrayal of him doesn't help either, right? Four score and seven years ago. <laughs> But this movie, to me, presented a side of Lincoln where he's animated, and he's driven, and he's passionate, and he is in your face. And his passion, and his intensity, and his overriding persistence to help the helpless and free the slaves is absolutely unwavering and driven and relentless. I'm going to show you a scene from the movie that maybe gives you a little bit of a slice uh, of the sense of his character. Lincoln is meeting with some of his advisors and they're trying to convince him just to give up on the 13th Amendment. That it's a lost cause. That he should stop messing around with the Constitution. That he's basically uh, harming and causing damage to the party and to his reputation. And finally, Lincoln has enough and his passion ignites. Let's watch this clip. What in your life ignites that kind of passion for you? Is there something in your life that would ignite that kind of passion? Is there something in your life that would cause that kind of reaction to come from you? Or do, do we all instead just sort of grousel and heckle and dodge about like petty-fogging Tammany Hall hucksters? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but whatever it means, it doesn't sound good. It sounds like he's cursing. What if in our lives we had that kind of passion? That kind of relentlessness and persistence that Lincoln had for freeing the slaves. What if we had that same kind of intensity of passion and persistence to continually cry out to God and to lift up our prayers to Him? Would it make a difference? The parable ends with Jesus asking a question. However, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? What kind of faith is Jesus talking about here? Because previous until maybe relatively recently, I would have generally answered that question by describing a faith that kind of figures out the right things to believe and say and do and then say and do and believe those things and hold on to them and God's going to be pleased with you. But my recent studying doesn't believe that. I don't think that's the kind of faith that Jesus is looking for. I think Jesus is looking for people who aren't afraid to struggle and wrestle and to keep pounding on the door of heaven for justice and blessing like the widow, like Jacob did in Genesis. I think Jesus is looking for that kind of faith that is honest and persistent and determined. And so my encouragement to you today is to keep praying and to not lose heart. To keep going even when it's hard. Even when the way doesn't seem clear. Even when you're tired and maybe you're even a bit sick of it. Even when life has burdened you down and maybe for you justice is nowhere in sight. To keep going. To keep showing up. To keep knocking on God's door. The great teacher Woody Allen once said that 90% of life is just showing up. I think there's actually some truth to that. That we keep showing up on God's doorstep, persistently bringing our prayers to Him. 
Not because God is like the judge in this parable who will eventually cave in to the barrage of our prayers, but because the spiritual reality is we are really more like the widow. Vulnerable, powerless, poor, and desperate. And if we truly understood that, then I think we would be driven to prayer with more persistence than ever. Let's pray. Lord, I I didn't want to give the impression that if we continually pray, Lord, that eventually we will get what we want. That's that's not what this parable teaches. In fact, um, your word in other places talks about some of the great martyrs of our past, Lord, who never received what it was that they strived for in their lives. That might be the case, Lord. And yet we are called upon to pray earnestly with persistence, Lord. And I think a lot of that has to do not with necessarily what we are striving for, but what you are striving to do inside of us, Lord. There's something about persistence. There's something about waiting that develops something inside of us. And yet, Lord, I know you hear our prayers. And so I know there are people here, Lord, we've struggled with this in our lives. Um, And my encouragement today, Lord, is to encourage people to keep going, Lord, to keep praying, to keep lifting up their concerns, to be persistent, Lord, to be determined, Father, to continually go before you, Lord, every day and lift up our prayers, Lord. I don't know, Father, if you're going to bring us the justice or the healing or whatever it is that we might be thinking, Lord. But I do believe with all of my heart, Lord, that unlike the unjust judge, you are a good God. And you will, Lord, in your time and in your providence, Father, lead us, Lord. Lead us into a place, Father, where you want us to be. So thank you, Father. Uh, just pray that you'll be with us, Lord, as we, as we spend some time now together. Uh, just enjoying one another's company. In Jesus' name, amen.